It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and welcome back. I hope you had a good holiday season. My question is to the Premier. For generations, Canadians have embraced the idea that our health care system should be there for patients, not for profit. We know the Liberals left our health care system in a mess, but as the Ford government moves forward, patients want to know, does the Premier agree with the principle that our health care system should be there for patients and not for profit? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, it's great to be back in the legislature here and take questions from the, the opposition. I can tell you, we got elected on fixing the health care system, taking care of the broken system as we call hallway health care. We inherited a system that was on life support. We inherited a system that over 1,100 people were in the hallways of health care facilities across this province. With our great Minister of Health, we're fixing this problem. We're making the changes. We're making sure that we consult with the frontline health care workers, putting teams of doctors together, teams of nurses together, and listening to the frontline health care people. They know better than all of us. They do the job day in and day out. But I can tell you, we're going to fix the hallway health care system. Response. We're making sure that we're going to have beds open, and no one's going to be in the hallway in the, in the next four years. Supplementary. It's worrisome that I didn't get an answer to the question, Speaker. According to documents from the Ministry of Health, the Ford Cabinet has already approved sweeping, a sweeping plan to create a mega bureaucracy, kill off health care agencies, and open the door to unprecedented levels of for profit health care. When the Minister of Health was asked about this, she said she hadn't even seen the documents, even though some had her signature on them. Now CTV News has ob obtained documents saying the new agency will be created this week. Can the Premier admit what his minister wouldn't, that this plan has been approved and will soon be impacting the care that people rely on? Premier, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I can tell the opposition leader that the people of Ontario elected us to strengthen and further develop our public, public health care system, and that is exactly what we're going to do. We know that we have a system that is not functioning properly. We have 30,000 people waiting for a long-term care bed. We have 1,200 people every day in hospitals across Ontario being treated in hallways and storage rooms, which is not where they want to be and not where the health care professionals who are caring for them want to be taking care of them. We also have thousands of people who are waiting for mental health and addictions treatments. And I don't know about you, but when you speak to a parent who's been told that their child is having suicidal thoughts and that they have to wait a year to get service, that is totally unacceptable and it cannot be dealt with. So what we are doing is centering Response. the system around patients. We are transforming the system, but it's going to be done by way of strengthening our public health care system. Final supplementary. Well, I can guarantee the Premier and his minister that the people of Ontario didn't elect them to siphon profits out of our health care system into the pockets of their friends. Speaker. The Premier is making Members, his friend, in fact, and former PC Party President Ruben Devlin, uh, paying him to devise a plan for health care, and he's diverting $350,000 a year out of frontline care to ensure that Devlin's uh, handsomely compensated for this work. Can the Premier explain why we're all paying Mr. Devlin to consult on a plan when he and his cabinet have already, have already approved all of the details? Minister. Well, I'm not sure if the leader of the official opposition heard what I just said. I said that we are going to strengthen our publicly funded system of health care, and so people will pay for their health care services using their OHIP card, as they always have done, and that no one is going to be able to skip ahead of anyone else in line because they have more money. That is not good quality patient-centered care. What we are working on is a system where people are going to 
have care that's coordinated so that when they leave hospital to go to home or long-term care, they have that warm handoff so that they know where they're going and that they're going to receive services and that they're going to receive those services in a timely manner. We don't have that across Ontario right now. That's what the people of Ontario have told us they want, and that is what we're going to deliver for them. Next question, Leader of the Official Opposition. My next question is also for the Premier Speaker, and I, I do want to uh, reiterate the fact that neither the Premier nor the Minister have said that they will not go to a for-profit delivery of health care in our province, which is the question that I've asked, and I'm going to ask it again. According to the Health uh, Ministry documents obtained by CTV News, the deal is already done, uh, but the government's challenge now is political spin and selling it to the public. The documents indicate that the board is scheduled to be appointed as soon as tomorrow, Speaker, and that the hunt Office, for the mega, government mega side, come to CEO order. is already underway. Can the Premier tell us which of his friends will be getting these prize positions? <laughs> Premier. Well, well, again, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, I've never met a group that spins more, more <laughs> items than, than my official opposition. They come up there, they're disingenuous with the people. They were. You know, ask, ask the Premier to withdraw. withdraw. Oh. Your answer, please. <laughs> well, that's just the beginning, my friend. <laughs> so, you know, they, I have to remind the public. Mongering. I have to remind the public that the opposition was part of destroying the health care system. Exactly. They voted with the previous government 98 percent of the time to destroy the health care system. We're putting money back into the system. We're getting rid of 1,200 uh, beds in the hallways. Yep. We're making sure we're consulting Spons. with the frontline docs and the frontline nurses. We're making sure we're going to fix the health care system. We've had announcements all over the province putting money into the infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, in his classic sticks and stones response, Speaker, I'm not buying any of it. The, mo the memo From was obtained by CTV, Speaker, and it warns very clearly that stakeholders, which presumably means frontline health professionals like nurses, and I quote, will target negative impact on health care delivery in their messaging. That's what this memo says. Can the Premier tell us what negative impacts patients can expect? Speaker? Good. 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 Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term well, Care. Mr. Speaker, I think there's a few things that the Leader of the Opposition doesn't quite understand. One is that there were a number of documents that were obtained inappropriately that were internal civil service documents, some of which I had never seen. And it is their job to come forward with ideas Opposition side, come to, to transformation, and that happens in every ministry. There's nothing unusual about that. But the other issue that I don't think she is aware of is the fact that there already is a large degree of private delivery of health care in our system. Doctors, labs, dialysis units, the list goes on and on, but people pay for those services with their OHIP card, and that is what is going to continue. What we are focusing our transformation on is public delivery, on connecting people with services, letting them receive those services in a timely manner. Right now, there is a huge disconnect, and I'm sure you've all heard that from your constituents as well. Thank you. <laughs> Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, what this minister and her premier don't seem to understand is that families expect a health care system that works for them, not for well-connected for-profit providers. Instead of listening to families about the challenges in health care, the Ford government's cooked up a scheme behind closed doors that's going to make things even worse for patients. And they've been denying that they were doing it the whole time. Will the premier come clean with Ontarians about his health care scheme? Minister. 
What I would like to tell the people of Ontario is that we've been working very hard at transforming the system into one that is modern, convenient for them, centered around them, and is connected for them because very often people feel when they are discharged from hospital that they're discharged from their health care system. It should not be that way. They should be connected with home care immediately or they should be transferred to long-term care. None of those things are happening right now. We are looking at what the patient needs, what every patient across Ontario needs. That is the focus of our work, and that is what we're going to continue to focus on. What do people need in Ontario to have an excellent health care experience? Stop the call. Restart the clock. Next question. The Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is to the Premier. Can the Premier tell us uh, whether it would be acceptable to him if the parent of a child coping with a physical disease like cancer was told that Ontario no longer covered all the treatments for the disease and instead was going to cover a fraction of the cost and leave families on their own? Premier. Well, again, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm not too sure where the Leader of the Opposition is coming from. We're putting money back into the system. We're putting money back into the health care system, no matter if it's cancer or if it's long-term care. That I have to remind, remind everyone that we ended up opening 6,000 new long-term care beds to make sure that we take the wait list down. We're going to put another 9,000 new beds over the next four years, a total of 15,000. Again, my friends, we're putting money back into the system, making sure it runs more efficiently, because every single doctor, every single nurse I spoke to across the province said that the system is broken. It needs to be fixed. They gave us ideas. We're implementing the ideas to make sure we have the best health care system in Ontario. Response. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, I'm going to help the Premier out a little bit, Speaker, because the scenario that I described is exactly what this government's done to children with autism and their parents. Right. It's bad enough that he betrayed his explicit, repeated promise that he would be there for families 1,000 per cent. But his minister, who is supposed to be the voice for families at the Cabinet table, threatened families and stakeholders who refused to praise her plan. If she, was, if she will not resign, the Premier should show some leadership and remove her from that role, Speaker. Will he do that, or will he continue to defend their betrayal of parents and children? Minister of Social Services. Thank you very much, uh, Premier, and thanks very much to the services. member opposite for her question, but it is inaccurate, Speaker. Let me be perfectly clear. As somebody who has been a champion for people with autism across this province for the past 15 years, who started the South Nepean Autism Centre, who's worked with the Minister of Health in this policy field for the past five mandates, I got to tell you, when I assumed this position, I saw a bankrupt Ontario autism program where 23,000 children, or three out of four children in the province of Ontario, were denied service and support from their government. That was immoral, it was unconscionable, and the best thing for us to do is to double our investment into diagnostic hubs and empower Opposition parents government government order. with funding so that they can get the services that they require. Speaker, I will be unapologetic in making sure that 100 per cent of the children that require support from their government when they have autism Report receive response. it. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Oakville. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's great to be back at. Hey, it's quiet. Wait for. Listen to you. Listen to you. Order. Premier will come to order. Premier will come to order. The Premier will come to order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The member for Essex, come to order. Clock's ticking. Come to order. Premier will come to order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The member for Essex will come to order. 
Member for Oakville will place his question. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade. Last week, our government, for the people, released driving prosperity, the future of Ontario's automotive sector. Our government was elected on a promise to protect and bring good jobs to Ontario. A big part of that is ensuring success of the auto sector. Auto sector jobs help families put food on the table, put their kids through college and university, and invest in their futures. They are the economic lifeblood of so many communities across our province, including my own in Oakville with the Oakville Ford Assembly Plan. Can the minister inform the House how this plan will build on our government's commitment to the auto sector and create and protect good jobs in our communities in Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, thanks very much, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Oakville, home to Ford Canada, uh, for the question today. Obviously, a very, very important investor in our province's auto sector. Let me set the stage for you, Speaker. When we became the government in June of last year, we had lost 300-plus uh, manufacturing jobs, including uh, some in the auto sector, Mr. Speaker, and it was time for us to turn that around so that there would be some stability for our very important OEM sector, our manufacturing auto sector, and we have done that very quickly. We brought in the Making Ontario Open for Business Act, Mr. Speaker, reducing red tape that was so harmful, legislation that was brought in by the previous Liberal government that was driving jobs out of Ontario, that was driving investment out of Ontario. We quickly moved to our Restoring Ontario's sure. Competitiveness Act, Mr. Speaker, Bonds. which again makes it more stable for businesses to invest in Ontario. Now we brought forward our Driving Prosperity Plan, investing in Ontario's auto sector, which is the yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the minister for the answer. Great. Over 100,000 people go to work in our auto sector every day at OEMs and downstream parts suppliers. Building cars and parts that go, in, that go into has driven so much of our province's prosperity over the last 100 years. It is crucial that our government parts support this important industry and in the future, a future that is changing rapidly. The shift of auto production into the U.S. and Mexico, the uncertain North American trade environment, and technological disruption have all weighed on the industry. Can the minister inform the House how our government's plan in the auto sector will overcome these challenges? And tell us, Minister. Thanks, Speaker. And you know, since 2009, Ontario's only attracted 6% of new auto sector investment in North America, thanks to the damage that was done by the previous Liberal government, driving up electricity classes, piling up red tape on the auto sector, Mr. Speaker. And it was time to turn that around. And that's why we brought in Driving Prosperity, focused on building Ontario's auto sector, making sure that those five manufacturers that are currently doing business in Ontario and those in the supply chain can be competitive, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and that's why Driving Prosperity is focused on three key pillars, competitiveness, innovation, and talent. And We're investing yeah, yeah. in all three of those pillars in our plan that was unveiled last week, Mr. Speaker, with the Premier at Woodbridge Group up in Vaughan. Very important to send that signal to this sector that Ontario is open Response. for business yeah, yeah. and Ontario is open for jobs, and that's why we're revved up, Mr. Speaker, yeah, about yeah. Driving Prosperity in Ontario's auto sector. Yeah, yeah. Up the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Since the minister's disastrous autism program announcement, families have taken to the street in protest. They're angry that services are being ripped away from their children. And now the media has reported that the minister and her staff forced endorsements and bullied their opposition into Shame. silence. Shame. Parents, advocates and service providers are all calling for the same thing, the minister's resignation. Will the minister listen to thousands of people across and parents Parents across this province and restore the integrity of the ministry and resign immediately. Right Members, please take their seats. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to start by congratulating the member opposite for being a grandmother today. 
Um, and then I'm going to second this by saying, no, I'm not resigning. I'm incredibly proud of this plan. This is a plan that the government has put forward. It is data-driven, it is evidence-based, and it is the most fair and equitable approach that we can Opposition take to 23,000 children languishing on an endless wait list to get them the services that they so desperately need. This is a government that is driven by making sure that we support early intervention, which I'm sure the member opposite would agree is important. Um, it, is, it is driven by a desire to empower, empower parents so that they can make the best choices for their families. But I ask the member opposite, why does she think it's okay for 23,000 children or three out of four children in the province of Ontario to be denied Fox. support from their government? I don't agree with that. Supplementary. I don't agree with anything this minister just had to say. First of all, it's not evidence-based, and only 25 percent, but now you're giving 100 percent nothing. It doesn't make sense, minister. <laughs> Speaker, the minister has sent a chilling message to communities that she is supposed to serve. The message is, if you don't agree with us, then the Conservative government will threaten you and bully you into submission. Wow. Children with autism and their families deserve so much better. And the families have spoken. We need a true investment in an autism program that meets children's needs. The ministry must go back to the drawing board on this Ontario autism program, but this time with a new minister. Will the minister do the right thing and resign so that work can move forward on the autism program? Members, please take their seats. Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I appreciate the passion for which the member opposite brings. This is a gut-wrenching issue, and when I inherited this portfolio, I inherited a bankrupt or almost bankrupt Ontario autism program that required $100 million uh, emergency funding just to service 25 per cent of the children. That was wrong. It was unfair, it was inequitable, and it was unsustainable. So, Speaker, as the minister responsible for this program, I'm doing what is in the best interest of all children. We're going to invest in early intervention. We are going to clear the weakness. We are going to double investments into diagnostic hubs, and we're going to pass the money directly to parents so that they can choose for between Essex, behavioral to order. therapy or diagnostic supports or for technological Hamilton, aids to or respite care or caregiver training. But uh, let me be perfectly clear, Speaker. This government believes in this plan. This government will implement this Waterloo plan, to and I will be the minister that does this. Stop the clock. and restart the clock. Next question, the member for Cambridge. My question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Speaker, I know that the auto sector will be a key part of ensuring that Ontario returns to being the driving force behind Canada's economy. This sector already employs thousands of people across the province, and I know that our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is working to create more good jobs for the people of Ontario. I understand that our government recently released the Driving Prosperity Plan, and that a key part of that plan is ensuring that Ontario has the talent we need to work in the auto sector of the future. Can the minister tell us what our government is doing to support Ontario's auto sector? The Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, thank you Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member from Cambridge uh, for that important question. The member is absolutely right about the importance of ensuring that our government is working as a partner with industries like the auto sector to create good jobs for the people of Ontario. And that is why I'm proud to take immediate actions to develop talent, such as cutting thousands of new, creating thousands of new internship and training opportunities, supporting online industry-led training Opposition to forward. aid in the upskilling of workers, providing targeted support for laid-off and other employed Ontarians from the auto sector to get back to work quickly and develop a talent roadmap and skills inventory to help identify current and future skills needs to support sector competitiveness. Speaker, these are concrete actions that are going to help the people of Ontario gain the skills they need to find high-quality jobs in the auto sector. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for those details. I'm proud that our government is not just paying lip service, but actually doing something to create jobs and ensure that Ontario is ready to lead in auto manufacturing for years to come. 
I think it's important to remember that the auto sector is more than just the assembly plants of specific car manufacturers. These facilities are also supported by a supply chain including 700 part firms and over 500 tool, dye and mold makers. With an industry that size, it's important that the government is taking steps not only to bring new people into the industry, but to ensure laid-off employees can upskill to continue to have high-quality employment. Can the minister tell us what specific steps the government is taking to help laid-off workers in the auto manufacturing sector? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the member is right to point out the thousands of businesses and individuals who are part of the automotive supply chain, ensuring that they have the skills and that laid-off workers can quickly return to or join the industry is crucial, not only to those workers and their families, but the health of Ontario's economy. And that is why I am proud of our government being committed to working with automotive partners to quicken the retraining and upskilling of workers across the industry. Our government is creating a micro-credential pilot, and we will partner with the automotive industry and work together to create this new and innovative way to certify talent in Ontario. This will allow the highly skilled individuals working or recently laid off avoid new and time-consuming apprenticeships Spons. or retraining by focusing on the training actually needed for new employment. Speaker, we are delivering on our promise to the people of Ontario to deliver good jobs and make Ontario open. Thank you. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier has announced an attack on post-secondary students that includes higher student debt, scrapping uh, grants, and attacks on student organizations. It's a change that only helps students from Ontario's wealthiest families. To quote an expert, any policy which leaves students from the top 5% of families better off and everyone else worth, worse off is, if you ask me, difficult to describe as fair. Will the Premier put a halt on this, reverse the decision, and support rather than attack students? Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, we know students and families across this province, a lot of them struggle to put, to put their children through university. What we're doing for the first time in Ontario's history, we're lowering tuition fees. We're lowering tuition fees by 10%. That's what they asked for. The students asked for that. Absolutely. The students, when we crisscross the province and talk to them, they're tired of paying high Position tuition fees. Yep. And the opposition for years down here argued about lowering tuition fees. So we should be on the same page. Not only that, we gave the students an option. Do you believe this? An actual option to opt out on fees, over $1,000 in some cases, fees to go to student fees that they don't even want to be part of, a lot of them. So they're going to have that option. To give you an example, a student at Carleton, Carleton University can save over Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Premier will take a seat. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. You know, it's uh, it's really true. Those uh, top-earning uh, families are going to be able to pay up front with their tuition fees, and so they're going to benefit from that 10 percent. Every other student, though, is going to have to take out more student loans because they're getting rid of the grants, Speaker. That's what's happening. So families are going to be worse off, Speaker. They're going to be worse off. The parents and students, in fact, are going to be to outside order. today. And in colleges and universities across the province, aren't clock. I, I apologize to the member who had the floor. Government side must come to order. I can't hear the leader of the opposition. Restart the clock. Member can conclude your question. On the lawns today, and young people in colleges and universities across the province are not crazy, Marks the Speaker. They're trying to make ends meet while they're getting the education that they need. Student organizations provide valuable support for students from providing health. Stop the clock. I would ask our visitors to refrain from this activity. 
or you'll be removed. Restart the clock and allow the uh, member to conclude her question. Look, Speaker, it's true that student organizations do a lot of good work and provide a lot of valuable supports for students, providing health care plans uh, and all kinds of other support pro programs for kids that are in crisis on campus. Some former student union leaders, in fact, are sitting in the PC benches right for King now. Vaughan, come Will the order. Premier call off his attack on the democratically elected student organizations and support the important work that they do? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, here's an example of indoctrination, what we just saw up there. This is part of the, the, the opposition uh, benches. That's how they train our kids, with a filthy mouth. They should have their mouths washed out with soap. That's what they should have, because that's embarrassing. Embarrassing. I just want to remind the Leader of the Opposition that actually the grants have gone up under our administration from 76 per cent up to 82 per cent. So they're going to get 82 per cent grant for anyone earning under $50,000. The actual people that need it are going to be able to go to school and get a grant of 82 per cent. That's what people are looking for. Get your facts right in. Stop the clock. Order. The government side will come to order. The opposition side will come to order. The Premier will come to order. The member for Essex will come to order. The member for Windsor West will come to order. The Premier will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Speaker, through you to the Minister, families have been calling my office concerned about how the changes to the Ontario Autism Program will affect their child's development. They're concerned, too, about their family's finances. They're genuinely distressed and concerned and anxious. So, Speaker, on the family's behalf, I would ask the minister to do these two things. First, disclose to the parents the financial details of the plan, especially the income testing, so they can plan and so they know what the future holds for them. Secondly, I would ask the minister to come back to the table, listen to these families, hear their concerns, and work with them. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister commit to doing these two things? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks, uh, Speaker. On the announcement day, I did make the commitment that this would be a $321 million investment into families with autism, which is um, much more than the $256 million the previous Liberal administration had offered. In addition, within, with respect to income testing, we were very clear that it is for those who make over $250,000 per year. But let me be perfectly clear. I have met with parents of autistic children uh, throughout my career. In fact, the first protest I ever attended 
was for, with Families for Autism in front of his office when he worked for Dalton McGuinty after the previous Liberal administration took families uh, with children of autism to court. Uh, I have uh, been steadfast in my resolve in trying to support all of the families, but it was unconscionable that the previous Liberal government left 23,000 children on an endless wait list with no hope in sight for support from their Ontario government. So I will stand here. I will defend our plan. It is fair. It is equitable. And most of all, Speaker, it is sustainable Response. for now and well into the future. Supplementary. Speaker, um, that's not the answer that I expected. And here's what I know. In 2016, when our plan came up short and 2,200 families were going to fall between the cracks, my colleagues and I listened to those families and we came back with a plan that required more money. And every one of us can agree here that this is about children and their families. It's not a partisan issue. So what we need to have happen here are two things. To disclose the financial details, it's simple, it's straightforward. They need to know about the income testing. And to sit down with these families, to work with them. I know this is a challenging issue in here. I've been on the other side of it. It's very challenging. But where it's more challenging is in the everyday lives of these families. So we need to walk a mile in these parents' Question. shoes. Can the minister commit to doing these two simple things? Yeah. Minister. Speaker, I just answered the question. $321 million, which is a lot more than the 256 that they had offered. We are offering to ensure that we clear the wait list of 26,000 children. It was unconscionable to deny three out of four children in this province, 23,000 children, service from their Ontario government. We're going to make it fair. We're going to make it equitable. We're going to make it sustainable. We are doubling the investment into diagnostic hubs. We are going to help Opposition parents to with direct funding. What is wrong, though, Speaker, is when that government, the previous Liberal government, left office, they were morally, ethically, and ideas bankrupt. They left the province almost bankrupt. And on June the 27th, I inherited an Ontario autism program that was bankrupt. Shame on them. <laughs> Stop the clock. Order. Next question. Start the clock. The member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, students in my riding of Carleton have consistently said to me that the cost of post-secondary education has skyrocketed under the previous government. And Mr. Speaker, I'm a personal example of that myself. Since 2006, undergraduate tuition for Ontarians such as myself has risen from an average of $5,000 to almost $9,000. Students and families are frustrated that the previous Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, allowed tuition fees to increase, making university and colleges more unaffordable for families and students. Can the minister please tell us what steps our government is taking to provide students and their families with relief? Good question. Good question. Mr. Training, colleges and universities. Carlton for the question. Speaker, our government has taken the unprecedented yep. step of reducing tuition across the board by 10 per cent. This is the first across-the-board reduction for all programs in Ontario's history. And this will mean a total of $450 million in tuition relief for families and students. And on top of this historic reduction, our government has created the Student Choice Initiative. This will treat students like adults and give them the choice whether to support optional fees. Just like tuition fees, under the previous Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, ancillary fees skyrocketed. Yep. Speaker, these steps will provide the relief to Ontario students that they need and end the Liberal legacy of skyrocketing Response. costs to post-secondary education. Yep. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. And Mr. Speaker, through you, honestly, I cannot even begin to think about the hundreds of 
almost thousands of dollars that I wasted in my 10 years of university paying these unnecessary fees for things that I never, ever used. Mr. Speaker, I am proud that our government is taking action to clean up the 15 years of increasing costs for students and families. And I understand that Ontario has the highest tuition fees in Canada. I'm still paying off my OSAP myself. And I'm shocked that the previous Liberal government, propped up by this NDP, took no action to stop this. So can the minister tell us what savings students in my riding will see because of this Opposition historic reduction of tuition fees? Thank you, Speaker. As the member notes, our government's unprecedented reduction in tuition will mean real savings for Ontario students. And that is why I'm shocked that the NDP and the Liberals have refused to endorse our plan. While the NDP are more concerned about the bottom line of institutions, we are proud to be putting more money back into the pockets of the people Absolutely. of Ontario. Speaker, in the member's writing, a student at Carleton University studying computer science will save $970 next year. Meanwhile, a student at Algonquin College studying a Bachelor of Interior Design will save $860 next year. These are real savings for students and their families across Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Last year, over 90,000 Ontarians received a cancer diagnosis. Cancer Care Ontario, a world-renowned leader in providing cancer treatment and support, was there with them every step of the way as they battled their cancer. Last month, we learned that the government plan to get rid of Cancer Care Ontario, that it will be absorbed into a super agency. Instead of fixing what's broken in our healthcare system, the Ford government is interfering with what works very well. What is the minister doing to ensure that patient care is not disrupted as our government carves up our health care system? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I would like to assure the member opposite, as well as the people of Ontario, that cancer care will continue at the ex in the excellent way that it is. It will not be diminished or abated in any way as more structural changes may be made. Uh, that it is really important that we look to Cancer Care Ontario as an excellent model for dealing with other diseases that may be considered more chronic, perhaps, than cancer, for diabetes, for uh, uh, for um, mental health and addictions, for example, it's still going to continue. People will still receive the essential and excellent care that they're receiving, despite anything else that might happen in the system. That, that cancer care functions will continue, and people will continue to receive care. They do not need to be concerned about that in any way, shape, or form. Supplementary. You see, Speaker. British Columbia tried to impose a super agency, and it failed. Yeah. Instead of having one of the best cancer agencies in the country, all that British Columbia saw was increased wait time and not much else. Alberta tried it also. It also failed. In Alberta, they suffered for 10 years of administrative challenges that took away resources that was met for patient care. Right now in Ontario, most of Ontario's health organizations, frontline health care providers, like nurses, have not been consulted on those sweeping changes to patient care. Can the minister explain to Ontarian that the changes she's been working on with low public consultation will not disrupt cancer patients receiving chemotherapy or and will not increase the wait time for people waiting for cancer treatment? Minister. Well, if you, you, Mr. Speaker, I can uh, assure the member that consultations have been ongoing about care for people, health care for people in Ontario with all sorts of different health groups. That's been since I was sworn in as Minister of Health. I've heard from uh, 
providers, healthcare providers, but also the people of Ontario. I've heard from them, as many of you have, about the concerns that they have about the gaps in our system, the way things are working well, but then the way things aren't working very well. And that's what we're focusing our attention on, is to make sure that we have a comprehensive and connected health care system, including the mental health system that we're studying now. So the consultations are continuing. We're still having discussions with provider groups as well as with patients and patient groups, people with lived experience. But I can also say that we, um, the Response. NDP, Mr. Speaker, have been making suppositions based on bits and pieces of information that were inappropriately leaked, and that is not. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the minister responsible from Aboriginal Affairs. Of Indigenous languages, and it's particularly important that we demonstrate and maintain our commitment to uh, Indigenous culture in the spirit of reconciliation. Last weekend, I had the opportunity to meet with some Anishinaabe leaders and elders, and we talked about the future Indigenous languages and culture. And I was concerned that the Indigenous Culture Fund has been cut in half because it was specific, specifically designed to help with the revitalization of indigenous languages, and it's a small fund. Indeed, Speaker uh, Jesse Wente described the cancellation of this fund as a gross attack on reconciliation. I understand that the minister has also decided to fight in court indigenous communities, and he has also decided to postpone Question. the promise revenue sharing I want to ask, is the minister believe, does the minister believe in reconciliation? The minister responsible for Indigenous Affairs. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We certainly are committed to reconciliation, and we're renewing our efforts, Mr. Speaker, by making sure that communities have the tools they need to engage in economic activities which will bring prosperity, strengthen their communities, Mr. Speaker. We know that language, Mr. Speaker, the ability to celebrate uh, their culture is strengthened when people are working, when their social and economic conditions have improved, Mr. Speaker. That's what we're committed to, and that's what we're going to continue to focus on moving forward. Thank Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Speaker. Back to the minister. The postponement of revenue sharing is hardly uh, conducive to Im improving prosperity. I think we have to remember that the Indigenous Culture Fund was created in 2017 specifically as a response and as a need to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. Why is this program being cut? And please, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, to the minister, can he commit today to actually restore the funding and continue to support it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. And I, I can commit to. Uh, uh, working on economic prosperity for those communities, something sadly neglected as somebody under the previous government, as somebody who has spent most of their professional life in some way, shape or form living and working, particularly in isolated and remote First Nation communities in Northern Ontario, nothing was accomplished to dramatically, even remotely, improve the social and economic conditions from that government, Mr. Speaker. We're working on a plan that will see resource revenue sharing for all of our Northern communities, municipalities, Mr. Speaker and Indigenous communities, capturing some of that wealth and keeping it in Northern Ontario. I know that's important for our strong uh, Northern Ontario caucus, Mr. Speaker. We're looking forward to making sure that every community in Northern Ontario has a, an opportunity for prosperity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, I know from my conversations from students and families during the campaign and since the election that the rising cost of tuition fees were becoming a real burden and a barrier to post-secondary education in Ontario. I heard countless times that tuition fees in Ontario are highest in Canada. 
Mr. Speaker, our government was elected to make on a promise to put more money back into people's pockets. And I'm proud that the action we have already taken to deliver on this promise. Our government has cut gas prices, frozen licenses fees, canceled drive clean program, and entered cap and trade carbon tax, and introduced lift the low income individuals and family tax credits. Can the minister tell us what steps our government is taking to make post-secondary education more affordable for families and students? Question. The Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. And thank you to the member from Scarborough Rouge Park for the question. Speaker, we have listened to students and their families who have been clear that the skyrocketing fees for university and college under the previous Liberal government propped up by the NDP were unaffordable. And that is why we have taken the unprecedented Opposition and historic step of reducing tuition by 10 per cent across the board. Speaker, many people recognize that we are taking the right step including members of the official opposition. The NDP members from Brampton Centre and Timmins both called the reduction in tuition a good start. Meanwhile, Gillian Phillips, president of the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations, said, quote, reducing tuition fees is good public policy for increasing Response. access to post-secondary education. Speaker, I'm proud that our government has delivered the first across-the-board reduction in tuition fees in Ontario. Thank you. Stop the clock. Supplementary. Start. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud that our government is putting students first by providing them a real relief on tuition fees. I know that for years, students and families have been saying that they did relief from the increasing tuition fees that were allowed to skyrocket under the previous Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, it seems that the opposition are speaking out of both, of their, both sides of their mouth. In one breath, they are saying they want the tuition relief for, from tuition. And the next, they are saying they, want more, they are more concerned about the bottom line of institutions. Despite the opposition rhetoric, I know the minister has clarified 10% reduction in tuitions will only... Ask the member. Okay. Yeah. Just to make clear, when the speaker stands up, whoever's got the floor has to sit down. I'm asking the member to withdraw his unparliamentary remark. Response. Minister. For years, the NDP have campaigned on a tuition freeze. Only now that they aren't the ones to do it are they criticizing real relief for students. The NDP are more concerned about the ability of institutions to handle a 3% reduction in funding than supporting $450 million in tuition relief for students and families. And it is clear that the NDP are not Order. for the students. However, Speaker, here are some responses from institutions across Ontario. John Fairley from St. Clair College order. says, quote, we will be functioning as normal. There are no discussions that we will be for decreasing Hamilton services East. or... I apologize. I'm going to ask the member for Hamilton East Stony Creek to withdraw his unparliamentary remark. I would ask the member for Hamilton East. Hey, I withdraw. I don't know why, but okay. The, the member knows full well you have to withdraw without qualifications or editorial comment. Speaker, I've used it 25 times in here. All of a sudden, it doesn't count? I'm going to ask the member for the third time. To please withdraw. I withdraw. Allow the minister to complete his remarks. John Fairley from St. Clair College wrote, quote, We will be functioning as normal. There are no discussions that we will be decreasing services or amenities to our college or increasing their fees. This is not on the table. John Tibbetts of Conestoga College says, We'll manage. We have to look for efficiencies, but the students will not notice. We will not be laying anyone off. Speaker, it is time. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Beaches, East York. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last Thursday, I met Michelle, whose five-year-old son, Elliot, is on the wait list for autism services. The family had to cash in their RRSPs and borrow to afford his nine hours a week of ABA therapy. Before he got the therapy, Elliot was completely nonverbal, but now he is speaking and developing important social skills. The funding that Elliot would get under the government's new autism program will not be close to enough to continue the amount of therapy he needs. Michelle says that most parents would say the wait list is better than the proposed changes. At least there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Why is this government digging in and continuing to move forward with these changes Question. against all the evidence and the advice of parents and service providers? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. I, I want to say to the member opposite, that was a really good question. And let me provide some context for you. Six months ago, when I inherited this program, it was near bankrupt. 8,400 children were receiving service in the province of Ontario, while 23,000 were on a wait list. The data we have means Elliot would probably age out of the program before he would, would be off the, off the wait list. We had to make a decision. I went to Treasury Board twice, securing over $102 million so that we could keep the program the Liberals left me intact for five months. We then invested an additional amount of money from the previous government, $256 million. Now we're at $321 million. Here's what we're doing with the money. We're going to double our investment in diagnose uh, hubs so that Response. we can support families quicker, and then we are going to clear the wait list in 18 months so Elliot will finally, for the first time in his life, receive support from the province of Ontario. Stop the clock. <laughs> Members will please take their seats. Start the clock. Supplementary. I would suggest the pie needs to be bigger so that each child can get what they need. I also met with Kristen, whose five-year-old son, Ryan, has severe autism. The family currently spends $1,000 a week on the four hours daily of therapy that Ryan needs. Their family had already burned through their line of credit before they received funding. The therapy has been critical. It has taught Ryan basic life skills, and he's now able to communicate using a program on an iPad, which has been a huge step for him to be able to concretely express himself. They have a contract until June, after which everything, including Ryan's development, will go on pause. The amount of therapy he will receive under the new regime is effectively useless. Why is this government moving ahead with a one-size-fits-all approach to autism funding that will only make life, life worse for children with Question. autism and with, for their families? Thank you. Minister. Um, speaker, I feel like there's a fundamental misunderstanding of this plan by the New Democrats and the Liberals, and I fear that that's going to create false hope for families that are out there in suggesting that, uh, that there was light at the end of the tunnel on the diagnos diagnostic and, and uh, service list. That's not true, Speaker. What, we've, what we inherited was heartbreaking. I've met children like Elliot and I've met ch children like Ryan. And one thing that our plan will do is allow Ryan's family to invest in technological aids when we provide them with direct funding, so we're empowering them. I don't think the member opposite knows that. I think it's extremely unhelpful for the opposition to try and whip up parents without the facts. And the fact order. is this. We opposition have come one to order. children in Ontario receiving support from the Ontario government. I could not, in good Response. conscience, allow that to continue to happen. We need to support all children with autism in the province of Ontario, and that's what this government is. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Opposition, come to order. Start the clock. Opposition will come to order. The clock's ticking. Okay. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my, speak my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Our government for the people made an election promise to upload the subway. 
The upload will turn priorities into projects. And we're going to finish those projects years before the previous government had even planned. I was at a town hall recently last week in Marina Del Rey in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore, and we all agree that our communities and our provinces are facing gridlock problems that which creates daily frustrations for commuters on roads, highways, and those who are taking public transit. Our government for the people was clear. During the election, we are going to reduce gridlock, Question. and that transit is essential to cutting that gridlock. Everyone's time is valuable, and it should be spent with families, friends, and— Thank you. Thank you. Order. Will the member please take her seat? The minister to respond. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Member Etobicoke Lakeshore, for that question and, and the importance of transit, not only in Toronto but across the region and across the province. But let me uh, inform the House on what occurred last week that uh, uh, we uh, came to a terms of reference with the City of Toronto and the TTC on uploading the subway system to the province. The uh, terms of reference at its core is showing a shared objectives and principles to guide a discussion about how the two levels of government can work together to achieve our, achieve our achieved goal and build a new partnership with the City of Toronto. The province is acting now because past governments chose not to take the necessary steps and bold action that was required. Maintenance and investment on the subway system has been put off for far too long, and people in Toronto and the region of a whole have been waiting far too long Response. for subway expansion. We are looking forward to working with the City of Toronto. I'm going to share more in my supplementary question. <laughs> supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through the member, I am pleased to hear that our government for the people reached an agreement with the City of Toronto on the joint terms of reference, which will start the uploading process. I know our government will work with the people and Ontarians and the people of Toronto to make transit better for everyone in the GTHA and across this province. As we all know, the new subway construction has been stuck in red tape for years. It is time to take action and speed things up. It is time to get people moving. We are improving how transit is built by building a world-class transit system that everybody, everybody in Ontario can be proud of. Can the Minister of Transportation share more Opposition about the joint terms order. of reference and, which it mean, and what it means for the Question. upload to the subway? Minister. Thanks again, uh, the member of Etobicoke Lakeshore, for that question. You're doing a wonderful time advocating for your constituents. Uh, thanks again for that question. And I'm going to be more than pleased to talk more about the terms of reference uh, and what that means for commuters, the City of Toronto, and the TTC. We have committed to a deliberate, fact-based conversation with the City on our upload plan. These terms of reference will guide our next steps and steer the consultation process with the City and the TTC on uploading the subway infrastructure from the City of Toronto, including the building and maintenance of new and existing subway lines. With a new partnership, our government can cut through the red tape and start new projects and finish construction faster. We are committed to getting the people of Ontario moving, and we're doing just that by starting with the upload of the subway and delivering on our projects right on schedule, Mr. Speaker. Response. I'm proud to be part of this government that's going to get Ontario moving and open it up for business. Next question, the member for London Fanshawe. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. As the minister well knows, too many people who need quality home care services aren't getting these critical, critical services and therefore are stuck in expensive hospital beds. In a recent opinion piece in the Toronto Star, Bob Bell, the former Deputy Minister of Health, says he's worried the government's secret plans will open the floodgates for private for-profit home care operators to have their way with little regulation or oversight. Can the minister tell us what role private for-profit players will play in the new health scheme, or is she still pretending not to know about the plans Cabinet has approved? The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, 
Mr. Speaker, I think it's very interesting that a lot of people are writing columns on something they don't really know anything about, other than some stray pieces of paper that have been inappropriately leaked to the public. But what I can tell the member, and what we've heard from the people of Ontario, is that they want to feel connected to their health care system. That means when they're being discharged from the hospital, they expect that home care is going to be there Opposition, for them come to order. in a reasonable time so they don't get readmitted back into hospital. That's what we're working on. We are working on connecting our public health care system to make sure that people, when they need health care, will pay for it with their OHIP card and that nobody else is going to be able to jump in line ahead of them just if they have money. It's going to be on the same basis that we've had, that people pay with their OHIP card, Response. and we are going to coordinate home care so that people will know by the time they're discharged from hospital that they will have the appropriate home care. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, personal, personal support workers are the backbone of home care, but this work is increasingly precarious with short shifts, low wages, especially from private for-profit operators. They don't have a voice at the table. But of the 11 members of the Premier's Council to improve health care and eliminate hallway medicine, two are CEOs of for-profit home care companies, and the third council is a former home care company board chair. Dr. Bell warns the private companies that provide Ontario home care are going to be supervised are going to be supervised more loosely, presumably by bureaucratic Queen's Park Super Agency. What is the minister's plan to ensure that home care dollars go to the patients who need them and help at home and not the companies Question. seeking profit off our health care system? Minister. Well, I can certainly assure the member and the rest of the people of Ontario that home care is going to continue to play an important role in the health care of Ontarians, along with uh, hospitals and long-term care homes. We, need, we know that there are many people who remain in hospital for longer periods of time than they need because there isn't a long-term care place for them or we don't have adequate home care services, so we need to build them up. We need to make sure that when people come home, more and more people are able to come home with more complex medical conditions because that's where they want to be. And we want people to go where they feel most comfortable. That is going to require an increase in home care services. And we need to connect home care services with the hospitals so when they're discharged, people who are Response. providing the home care will be able to connect with the people in the hospital to make sure that it is a seamless transition. We are not getting that now, and that's what our goal is. Thank you. That concludes the time we have for question period today. Point of order. Point of order. Uh, speaker, I would like to welcome two students from Queen's University who are here in the members' gallery today, Samantha Hartman and Hamid Mohammed. if we could welcome them. We'll deal with the points of order afterwards. I have to inform the House that earlier this morning, a motion for closure on the motion for second reading of Bill 48, an act to amend various acts in relation to education and child care, was moved by Mr. Harris. The closure motion carried on a voice vote. The House then went on to deal with another item of business and then recessed before question period. This resulted in the motion for second reading of Bill 48 not having been dealt with. When a motion for closure is carried, the main motion needs to be disposed of forthwith. It having not been done so at that time, I am therefore going to rectify this situation by putting the question now, this being the first available opportunity to do so. Ms. Thompson has moved second reading of Bill 48, an act to amend various acts in relation to education and child care. We're in the we're in a vote. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? I heard some no's. All those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. All those opposed will please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Will the members please take their seats? Will the members please take their seats? It is time for the members to take their seats. <coughs> Ms. Thompson has moved second reading of Bill 48, an act to amend various acts in relation to education and child care. All those opposed to the motion all those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recorded by the clerk. Ms. Thompson. Thompson. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith Bay Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay Quincy. Mr. Bethlehem Father. Mr. Bethlehem Father. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Tangle. Mrs. Tangle. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Tanigas. Mr. Tanigas. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Oh. Ms. Stiles. Ms. Stiles. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Should be Song. Ms. Should be Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamaka. Mr. Mamaka. Uh, Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Shimanta. Ms. Shimanta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Uh, Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rokosov. Mr. Rokosov. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. All those opposed to the motion, please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. The ayes are 105, the nays are zero. The ayes being 105 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Yes. 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 Or referred to a committee. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of Education, is, is the bill going to committee or not? It can go to committee if need be. And social policy, social policy. So ordered. So ordered. The bill has been referred to the Social Policy Committee. Okay. Okay. This House stands in recess. Okay. I, I'm going to say once again to the House, the Speaker cannot read your mind.
If you have a point of order and you'd like to present it to the House, st please stand up and audibly yell out point of order and I'll be able to hear you and hopefully be able to recognize you. Point of order? The member wants. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to welcome two students from the Fanshawe College Law Clerk Program in London. Uh, Sarah Richardson and Mary Metcalf are here this morning, along with uh, Mercedes Mitchell from the Toronto Film School. Welcome. Point of order? Is that what it is? The member from Mississauga, Mississauga Mall. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to welcome Annie Lou and Daniel O oh and my son Shreyansh Anand to Queen's Park, who is here on Reading Week and starting his first job tomorrow. Welcome to Queen's Park. Member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome my executive assistant for first time here at the Legislative Assembly, Meru Khan. Thank you very much. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.